This is the John Bachelor Show. That is the Mad Max theme, which means Ms. Kissel is here. Mary Kissel of the Wall Street Journal's editorial board and the host of her own show, Opinion Journal, each day at 1 p.m. Mary, we only roll out Mad Max when we're absolutely sure we're connected to Australia. And I believe we're absolutely sure. First of all, a welcome, Mary. You have seen this story passing in front of all of us of the sandwiching of the prime minister. Uh, is there one explanation that you want to offer before we go to Australia and, and get filled in on the politics? It's remarkable, John. I've never seen anything like it. You see shoes thrown in the Middle East, but to see a sandwich thrown down under, especially by children, uh, seems to me a little off. Like maybe the parents coach them somehow. We're doing politics tonight. There is an Australian election, but it's not imminent. It's not going to begin for several months. But it could begin earlier. We've just found this out this week. Breaking news, John. Uh, all right. W not once, but twice. The sandwiching of the prime minister. I mean, in of, August, not this week. Of a major, <laughs> of a major part of the global economy. Australia is a is a fundamental part of the Asian economy, but the natural resources make it part of the 21st century. And we're joined now by James Patterson from the IPA. Uh, James, a very good day to you, and thank you for this. It's a late-breaking story. You'll forgive us. We're slow to the sandwiching. Is this actually a term that is used in your news now, that the Prime Minister was sandwiched? Uh, the first time it was a phenomenon. The second time it looks like a pattern. Good morning to you, James. Good morning, John. And, and yes, to my great shame, uh, it is now a term uh, that is widely used in Australian politics, and we can see now over in the US as well. So I hope Americans don't think less of us, but yes, we throw sandwiches at our Prime Minister. James, that seems so unprecedented to me, however. I mean, a Prime Minister, you may be closer to the Prime Minister down there. You can get physically closer in a, in a crowd when they go out to meet the citizenry, but uh, throwing things? Isn't, isn't this new? Yeah, it's definitely new. I mean, Australians have never had the same level of respect for the office of Prime Minister as Americans do for the office of President. It, we've, we have a much more uh, egalitarian culture where we don't consider the Prime Minister to be very much above the average citizen. They're really one of us. But even for Australians, this is a, a new low. Uh, it's, it's pretty extraordinary that um, physical objects are being thrown uh, at the Prime Minister. I mean, we should be clear in this case we're talking about children. Right, uh, right, I think right, the culprit right. was 13 or 14 years old. Uh, this is not grown adults, but nevertheless, I think it is reflective in, in some way of the way in which the current Prime Minister has really devalued the office of the Prime Minister and, and brought it, its respect in the community to rock bottom lows. It's a treat, Mary, to be joined by a second commentator from Australia, Tim oh. Wilson, joins us now. Tim, a very good day to you of the IPA. Tim, can you help us understand where these sandwiching events took place, the landscape. I'm looking at the map of Australia. I'm looking at an interactive video that shows the sandwich event. The one, the second one, I believe, was in Canberra, right, Mary? Which the is, capital, which is the right. capital. But the first sandwich event is not there. Can you read this map for us, Tim, and say what it means about the politics right now pr approaching the election? Good morning to you. Good morning, and the second, the first sandwich incident uh, occurred in Queensland, which is sort of the reverse of uh, the United States. It's in the sort of equivalent of Deep South in the United States as it is uh, what's called the Deep North in Australia by comparison. Uh, and uh, what it means fundamentally is that there are these serious issues now around the respect for the office of the Prime Minister. James is 100% right about the fact that we normally don't see uh, the Prime Minister as anything greater or more important than the average citizen, but equally it doesn't deserve this disrespect, and because there's been so many issues with our current Prime Minister and an absence of respect for the, it flowed through disrespect for the office, and I think it's just reflecting sadly the frustration that a lot of Australians have because they want an election which is scheduled for September 14, but people would like it done and dusted and over and done with. Well, Tim, I thought that Canberra was Labour territory, and that's the party of the Prime Minister, so who could possibly be upset with her there? Well, I don't think it is so much a partisan comment or a reflection of partisan sentiment. I think it is about the individual, sadly, uh, and it's also about uh, how much the office has been derided by the current individual, by the action uh, that she has taken. I mean, uh, to put it in perspective, our Prime Minister said publicly at one point that there, she had a real personality and a fake personality she sometimes projected to the Australian people. That sort of only breeds contempt. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to speak 
speak to not one but two representatives of the Institute of Public Affairs. And though it looks like we're making light of the election, these sandwiching incidents look to be a break in the long run-up to the election. So, Mary, you, uh, the last time we reported this, we believe the election would be called for September. Has that date changed? That's right. I think there is a movement on the ground to hold it earlier, maybe even as early as August. Uh, James, uh, is that a real possibility now? And if so, how does that happen in your parliamentary system? I'd be very surprised if the election doesn't go ahead on the date that it's been set for, which is the 14th of September. In a parliamentary system, an election can happen at any time for a couple of reasons. The Prime Minister has uh, the complete prerogative to call the election earlier, but given that Julie Gillard has already said that it's going to be on September 14, it's unlikely that she would change that. Uh, the second reason that an election could be called earlier is if the government loses a motion of confidence in the lower house, in the House of Representatives. So if the majority of elected representatives decide that the government no longer has the confidence of the parliament, then it will be forced to go to an election. Now, for that to happen, what would be required is for the opposition, for Tony Abbott to move a motion and for it to be supported in the parliament by the independents. Now, over the last few years, the independents have shown extreme levels of loyalty and commitment to the, to the Labor government. Occasionally, they'll criticise it in public, but every time a motion like this has been put before the House of Representatives, they've voted with the government and to protect the government. And the main reason that they've done that, other than that they have a preference for the government's policies, is that if they, if an election were to be held, many of these independents would be wiped out. Uh, these independents represent, in many cases, quite conservative electorates, but they've signed, sided with a quite left-wing government, and their constituents really are lining up, waiting to punish them for doing so. So these guys don't want an election any earlier than it needs to be. I remind everyone that uh, Australia is on the right side of the world, so though it sounds like August and September, and who would have an election? in the heat of the summer. This is winter time for Australia, which means it'll be raining, the weather will be inclement, and everybody is very politicized. Mr. Wilson, uh, I make a point, because these sandwiching events have happened at schools, the last time we spoke to, I believe, Mr. Roskam, uh, we ha were just discussing how uh, the Gillard government was pouring, or proposing to pour, an enormous amount of money into the school system in order to change the calculation for, I believe, a local government, a provincial governor, who is with uh, is with uh, Mr. Abbott's party. Has that is that still part of the Labour plan to divide and conquer uh, Liberals? Uh, absolutely, it is, and uh, it's always been part of the plan of distraction in the lead up to September 14 election. Uh, what we basically know is, on current polling, the government will be annihilated at the federal election. They're trying to divide uh, the Liberals, the Conservatives, against each other to try and distract attention and public attention away. But you know, this will have no impact on what average students or parents think about the government, because uh, basically, for years and years and years. In Australian politics, we've been told the problem with our schooling system is not enough money. We've tipped uh, billions of dollars into the education system and it hasn't improved standards and people are rightly now understanding that teacher training and, and other as aspects of uh, school education matter more, not money. So this is not a reflection on that. Speaking of money in elections, I understand that there's also been a movement for more disclosure about money in politics. James, I wondered if you could give us an update on where that debate stands. James, you there. Um, the Australian uh, system of campaign finance is actually very deregulated. Uh, there's no limits on the amount of donations that you can make, and disclosures only have to be made currently if the donation to a political party is over $12,000 a year. Um, but the Labor Party this week tried to push through two changes. One was to lower the limit for disclosures, so donations now above $5,000 would have to be disclosed. But secondly was to massively increase the public funding to political parties. Uh, political parties already receive millions and millions of dollars each election based on the number of votes they get from the taxpayer. But the Labor Party is having a very difficult time fundraising in the lead up to this election because everybody regards them as likely to lose and their base is very demoralised. So as part of a way of addressing that, they hope to tip in a whole lot of extra taxpayer dollars. And at least for a few days, they had the opposition support to do that. The opposition uh, recognised that they too would have got a lot of extra money out of this deal. And so they secretly agreed to this deal. But when it became public, there was a huge backlash against this. Uh, Australians uh, have, as I mentioned before, don't regard politicians with particularly high standing, and the idea that politicians were going to take even more of their 
money from taxes to spend on their political campaigns was extremely unpopular uh, and generated a ferocious response from the community. Uh, and so after a bit of to and froing and quite a lot of pressure, uh, the opposition, Conservative opposition, withdrew their support for the package uh, and it has now collapsed. These two gentlemen from the, uh, from the Institute of Public Affairs, it's in Melbourne, Victoria State, in Australia. And final question to you, Tim. Uh, my understanding right now, uh, and it, you know, it, bear, it bears watching right now, is that uh, the climate change legislation moved by Gillard's government was the beginning of the decline of her popularity. Does this election uh, settle the climate change story? In other words, to turning her out of government, have you overturned climate change? Uh, just 30 seconds, Tim. Okay. Well, when when uh, the Prime Minister was elected, she went, ran on the promise there'd be no carbon tax under the government she leads. She broke that promise at this election. The main Conservative opposition is saying they will repeal it uh, and remove the laws, and I think it will settle it uh, for at least for the good uh, foreseeable future because the public have made it clear they don't want a carbon tax and they don't want these sorts of expensive regulations. The question is whether the opposition, the Conservative opposition, replaces it with anything, and we're hoping they won't. Looking forward to the the Australian election. Uh, James Patterson and Tim Wilson of the Institute of Public Affairs. Uh, morning time, a winter coming on in the right side of the world, Australia. Mary Kissel, the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal and her ho the host of Opinion Journal each day at 1 p.m. for our Australian listeners at 1 p.m. East Coast time. It's a very comfortable time for ladies and gentlemen in Australia in the afternoon. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. <laughs>